Good evening, everyone. I'll call this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. by recognizing the traditional keepers of this land and specifically our neighbors of the Alderville First Nation with a formal territorial acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that the municipality of Brighton is located on the Mississauga Anishinaabek Territory and is the traditional territory of the Mississauga. Council of the Municipality of Brighton respectfully acknowledges that the Mississauga Nations are the collective stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. This week, we're flying the flag of the Royal Canadian Air Force at 35 Alice Street to acknowledge the Canadian Armed Forces Day, which was yesterday. The municipality uh, continues to express our, our deep solidarity with the Ukrainian people as part of that solidarity and as a welcoming and inclusive community I highlight our unwavering support for the Ukraine, the Ukrainian people, and for democratically elected sovereign governments around the world. Brighton, our council, and our citizens are deeply concerned about the humanitarian toll the invasion will take on the Ukraine and its citizens. That will move into the approval of the agenda. I do have a motion to amend the agenda, moved by Councillor Rowley, seconded by Councillor Anderson. The council amend the agenda to change, note, change notice of motion 10.4 to a motion for council's consideration on this date, June 6, 2022, as that would require a um, two thirds majority vote for this consideration. Council Rowley, I'll ask that you uh, advise why you think this is an urgent matter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, as per the uh, notice of motion, um, there have been some concerns regarding vandalism uh, over this last little while within the municipality and uh, of course on um, municipal property as well. Uh, my concern is that if we leave it until the end of June, it will be well into July before we can come up with any kind of um, action as to maybe get uh, groups together as the um, as stakeholders just for some preventative measures, just to discuss the meeting, not to come up with any um, with any solutions at this point. But it would be nice if we could maybe uh, pull some of the uh, groups together to just have a have a discussion as to how we can kind of uh, further prevent some of this. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll ask if there's any discussion on the motion, which is to amend the agenda. Any discussion? Councillor Bateman? My only question would be for the parties that you want to get together, can you get them together before the end of June? I would, I would hope we could. Uh, I, I would hate to see us leave it till July or August. Summer will be over, and uh, who knows how Probably far some of this will be. Probably a discussion we should have okay, thank when you. we debate the motion, if, if it becomes a motion. Any further discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. With that, a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Council Blanc, that the Council approve the June 6, 2022 Council agenda as amended. Is there any discussion? Uh, just uh, need just to start to pay. Pay. When we get to 12 today's agenda, from council the May 2nd agenda, does okay. that, uh, can we talk freely? Because 5.1 was enclosed from May 2nd. So when we're, when we're debating 12.3, I want to assure that everybody feels comfortable, myself included, that we don't say anything that come, came out of closed. So you're talking about the bylaw for the ORO service agreement? That's correct. Um, the, on, the only debate we could have would be on the, on the agreement itself, not on anything that was discussed that brought us here today, essentially. Anything further from members of council? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Members of council, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? And if so, please state the general nature thereof. There are none noted. Are there any announcements this evening? Councillor LeBlanc. Thank you, Mayor. On behalf of the council, I attended the electric car show uh, on Saturday in uh, Coburg. And there was over 500 uh, attendees that came. You could drive any type of electric car that was there. And also this, they had their sustainability committees that were there and the blue dot committees were there. But it was quite amazing to drive these cars and to see how they were, how they were. And, but 
And I also saw the police car, the new police car cruiser that they have for the city of Coburg. And he told the story of how he had to go to the governor general to get permission to lose, use the electric car for high speed chases or to put detainees in it because it didn't fit. They had to go amend the regulation for it. It's quite a good story, but it was a great, uh, great participation. Thank you for letting me go there, Mayor. Thank you for going on behalf of council. Appreciate that. We don't have any electric charging stations yet in Brighton. Apparently that's in the works and we'll, uh, um, we'll one day get a report on that, I'm sure. Anything further from members of council with regard to announcements? Councillor Bateman. Under the same line, I attended a couple of weeks ago on behalf of council, the Alzheimer's walk in Quinney West. It's the Quinney West Brighton walk for a cure and it was quite successful. I think they raised just under around, right around $9,000. And the only other announcement and I know everybody's tired of hearing of COVID. The last two vaccination clinics are coming up. There'll be one on June 11th at ENSS and then one June 25th. And then going forward, it'll only be available at the health unit and the GoVax bus is going into July. And then hopefully we never have to fire them back up again. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Blanc. Yes, on this weekend, I participated in the um, accessibility challenge and uh, I saw how wearing the glasses, how sight affects you and how it affects and why we have to do certain things and colors and set certain things up for accessibility. The one that got me was the wheelchair accessibility on the corner here on Main Street is basically I had the wheel. If I didn't have somebody behind me, I would have planted myself in the face going in and going off on both ends by old Mrs. B's and by the old monument and going across. They said I was too big for the chair and too heavy. So we put Mrs. Levine in it and she did the same, exactly the same thing. So it had nothing to do about weight or size. It has to do with the angle and how it is. We have fixed those sidewalks twice. And without doing that challenge, I would have never saw all of this. And I, to me as a counselor, I'm a bit disappointed that if we have people with accessibility with the motorized or with wheels, that they, it's our major intersection. And the other thing is, I know 17 seconds is long, other people have 10. It took a lot of time for me to make it across because I was planting and getting stuck. And I tried it all different angles. And I think it should be looked at. And, and, and you. you have brought to that to the attention of Public Works, is that correct? That's correct, thank I you. appreciate that. Any other announcements this evening? Well, Friday night I was invited to prom, isn't that wonderful? Um, <laughs> you had the opportunity to First time I was invited, yeah. <laughs> I, in the past, I had to do the inviting. It's a true story. Uh, the principal of um, ENSS invited uh, Tammy and I to attend prom and greet the students as they uh, came into the prom. Uh, they were all, of course, very handsome and lovely looking, but more importantly, um, they were excited to be able to come together and have a, a, a quasi-normal event for a change. So the gym was done up uh, quite nicely, and they had a good night, I hope. And I didn't read about anything uh, bad afterwards, so it must have been good. <laughs> Any other announcements? Go ahead, Council Rowley. It's not an announcement, but can we have a small discussion on your prom invite regarding how prom parades will happen in the future, maybe? Or is that for another day? Uh, I think that that would be for uh, ENSS to have that discussion with uh, emergency services and um, and the municipality? We, we can engage in that with them, um, but that will be for another day. Thank you. You're welcome. I do appreciate your concern in that regard, though. Any other announcements? It takes us to adoption of the minutes, moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Rowley, that Council adopt the, meet, the meeting minutes from the May 16th, 2022 meeting as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. We have one public meeting this evening with regard to the naming of corporate assets. Public members are asked to provide input into the naming of the park on Daniels Drive in recognition of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee as the Queen Elizabeth II Park. The rationale for this recommendation is to honor Her Majesty the Queen. The Queen's reign has been marked by an exceptional series of milestones. Her Majesty's Jubilee and birthdays have provided cause for celebration and reflection throughout the remarkable years since her accession. 
Such events help reinforce the Queen's role as a focus for national identity and unity as people across the nation come together to mark an important occasion. Is there anyone joining us who would wish to make comment or have questions with regard to the concept of renaming the park on Daniels Drive, Queen Elizabeth II Park? Anyone present? Anyone on Zoom? Be aware of anyone joining us for that purpose. I will read the motion, but I will also note that um, if we are to pass this motion, there is another process before we can move forward. We need the governor general's office to, uh, to approve the naming of the park uh, in, in the name of any member of the royal family. It's moved by Council LeBlanc, seconded by Council Rowley, that Council receive public comments regarding the naming of the park on Daniels Drive in recognition of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee as Queen Elizabeth II Park, even though there aren't any. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Sorry, go ahead, Council Rowley. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the few emails that were forwarded to Council regarding the uh, reasoning for maybe not using this name or for other names. So. Um, if we approve this this evening, or if we, can we defer something like this so that it could go back to community events to withdraw the recommendation, or is that not a good thing to do? I would like to have discussion around the other, the other concerns that we received via those emails. Okay, so we have, we have already approved the recommendation. Council has already approved the recommendation okay. from community events. So this is the next step to go down that road. Um, I would certainly allow that discussion now, given that um, this is the this really is the last time for any public comments, including members of council. So, please, by all means, go ahead. Are, are you? Are you um, there, there was one. There was one about. There was one concern about um, truth and reconciliation. Correct. And, and then there and was the also community. another person so, named that we could that we another name that we could maybe recognize in place of as well, right? Right. So I, I would suggest the name of someone else. Maybe we hold in abeyance for another okay. time in another place, okay. given how far we've gone down the road here. Um, with regard to the um, concern around the Indigenous community and truth and reconciliation, I would say that if the Governor, Gen if we pass this and the Governor General gives us permission to move forward, it would be my intent to invite the Indigenous community to join us in the celebration of renaming that um, through, through the Chief uh, at Alderville First Nation. Um, perhaps with a smudging ceremony or okay. or whatever they deem appropriate uh, for this purpose. Okay. Well, I'm I'm comfortable with that then. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. The motion is to uh, receive it. So, but you said this is the last chance to discuss it. Yeah, we because council has already passed the approved the recommendation from community events. Okay. Um, There you go. Yeah, I, I'd suggest we're not rushing into it. We had a recommendation come from community events. We considered that. We passed that motion. We've gone through a public process. We've we've asked for comments. We've received two or three emails, maybe four at the most. We've had no one appear uh, before us at the public meeting for this purpose. And, and now we would pass this information along to the Governor General's office to ask that um, we proceed down the road. So I don't, I don't think it's a rushed process. A rush process would have been us passing the motion a couple of weeks ago and a sign going up the next day, which of course we wouldn't be allowed to do in this in this case. So
We've already passed the motion to proceed. So this is just, if you have any comments to make, we appreciate them and, and we'll continue down the road. Thank you. Thank you for that, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to, I was going to say a few of the things that you said already that we, we did only receive two or three comments. No one's here tonight. Uh, we're not uh, we're not renaming anything or changing anything. It was just, I believe it was because of the Jubilee that we thought that, you know, we would name this park. So uh, I'm in support of it. Obviously uh, we've already made that decision anyway. So I'm okay with going forward with this. Thank you, Councilor Cadman. I could repeat whatever um, Deputy Mayor has said, but I just want to say how many of us are going to have a jubilee. Right. And I, I think it's important to recognize the long service of, of, of our queen. Thank you for that. I concur. Is there anything further from members of council? Councillor Bateman. Uh, just to echo what both the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Tadman said, but to add to it, you'd already touched on that you're going to be reaping your chief a lot. And I think that's probably the most important conversation I'm comfortable with this. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll wait to hear what the governor general's office has to say first, obviously, before I read that, that will be my intention. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. So that brings us to delegations and presentations. Our first presentation comes from Hydro One Community Relations to present its work to support the utility enabled broadband pilot project in the municipality. Uh, who will be speaking to this? Is there only one person from Hydro One? Is that you, Brian? No. There's several of us here, uh, here from Hydro One. Who's, who's going to be uh, carrying on the presentation? Or um, I will be, my name is Alex. Go ahead, Alex, thank you. Great. I don't know, we have a presentation we can pull up. Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you for having us today. We are very excited to provide Brighton Council with an update on Hydro One's role, our progress, and steps to bring improved internet reliability to the municipality of Brighton. My name is Alex Moskalik, and I'm the senior manager here of community relations at Hydro One. With me today is Ryan Bookner, who is the project manager, as well as Harry Prasad, VP of Ac Operations of Acronym Solutions, formerly Hydro One Telecom. You may recall in April, we were part of the government's announcement for a local pilot project to enable high-speed internet for nearly 1,450 homes and businesses in the Brighton area. The pilot would use the reach of Hydro One's existing electricity infrastructure in the area and a network of fibers, cables provided by Acronym Solutions. I know Councillor Bateman and LeBlanc are on the Rural Broadband Committee, and I just wanna thank you for your ongoing guidance and support on this. Um, and of course, Mayor, uh, we, we really do appreciate your continued support. Today, we'll walk you through details around our partnership with the province. We'll provide a map of the infrastructure, talk a little bit about Hydro One's role and work, our community engagement strategy, and of course, next steps in discussion. The pandemic has underscored the importance of fast and reliable internet service. Hydro One is pleased to play a role in a larger initiative to work with the province of Ontario to make it easier to expand access to rural broadband. The spirit of the pilot is to utilize Hydro One's network to expand the reach of existing electricity infrastructure and proximity to our existing stations. Hydro One is proud to serve the municipality of Brighton as its electricity provider and through this rural broadband pilot, we are providing a cost-effective solution to enable broadband. Supporting the expansion and enhancement of high-speed internet and cellular service is another part of Hydro One's ongoing commitment to energize life in the communities where we live and work. 
We'll now turn over to Harry to go over the location of some of the critical infrastructure pieces. Harry? Thanks, Alex. Acronym Solutions is a telecom subsidiary, which is part of the Hydro Unlimited family of companies. With more than 20 years of experience managing the telecom network that enables Ontario's electrical grid and our own commercial telecom network, Acronym is well positioned to support this innovative pilot program. This area was chosen because of existing Hydro One infrastructure, such as hydro poles, distribution stations, and the communications tower, as well as existing Acronym network sites, which can be leveraged to achieve the required coverage for the pilot and enable broadband expansion in this area. On the map, you can see the purple lines, which represent the location of our new fiber optic cable, which is being installed by acronym on Hydro One's infrastructure. You can also see three of the existing Hydro One existing distribution stations or DSs, as they're labeled on the map, Murray Hills and Brighton Division, which are inside the municipality of Brighton, and Workbrook DS, which is in the municipality of Trent Hills. The Brighton shelters uh, are acronym telecommunication set shelters, which have our network equipment, which we use to provide services to the ISP. We have two network locations, one in the north and one in the south. The Wade Corners communication tower is an existing Hydro One communications tower. Now I'll turn it back over to Alex to talk about our work on the specific sites. Thank you, Harry. Just wanna reiterate that we are, we are excited for this project to come to life. Over the past month, we have worked to upgrade our poles to accommodate the fiber. We began installing equipment to support the new fiber and new fiber installations will begin this week. Next, we will begin the process to install the three new, new communication towers. We will be following the steps as outlined in your municipalities communication tower antenna siting review policy so that we meet our in-service date of December, 2022. As I noted, Hydro One in the province examined the general area and determined together the distribution stations that would need to be utilized to enable broadband capacity capability. The Hydro One team then proposed more specific locations for the towers based on their proximity to the stations, required space and proximity to homes. You can see on the map a proposed tower location for the Brighton Division Distribution Station in the Butler Street area, just south of the railway. In this map, you see the proposed location on the Murray Hills distribution station. It's just outside the station in a very rural area. Moving on, in this map, you see that while this is in Trent Hills, it is right on the municipal boundary. Similar to Murray Hills, the proposed location is just outside Walkward distribution station and is also rural. We are committed to ensuring the community is aware of the work required and the benefits to their community. In early August, we will be holding an open house to speak with residents and provide them with information on what they can expect, answer their questions, and discuss the project. Consistent with the municipality's communication tower antenna siting review policy, we will provide residents within the general area at least a 30 days notice through flyer distribution to homes, and newspaper ads, which will include information on the open house, as well as contact information for Hydro One's project. Anything that the council can do to share these details of our open house through social media channels would be appreciated as well. We look forward to meeting with residents at the community open house. Construction could start this summer and could be completed by the end of the year to allow for increased access to broadband to be available to those who need it most. In terms of next steps, Acronym will not be providing a residential internet service directly to residents of Brighton and to the surrounding area. They will partner with internet service providers or ISPs who will be providing that residential internet service. ISP build out with coordination from the deployment of tower and fiber infrastructure, and we expect residents to be connected in the first quarter of 2023. As your local electricity provider, we are excited to be part of this pilot project to enable high-speed internet for nearly 1,450 homes and businesses in the Brighton area. I wanna thank you again for your support as we move forward on this important project. We're happy to take questions.
Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Harry. And uh, although Ryan, you didn't speak, thank you for uh, coming and, and being um, backup support for the other two. We do appreciate your uh, openness uh, to provide information to council. We also appreciate the fact that Hydro One has chosen Brighton for the pilot. I know there was uh, some work from a, uh, the background in, in, in the political realm to make that happen. And, and we certainly appreciate uh, the work of uh, councillors LeBlanc and Bateman um, moving that along, but also, of course, our MPP, uh, a recently re-elected MPP uh, for uh, making this happen here in Brighton. It is, um, it is exciting news for our community, a community that has been uh, significantly challenged in the rural area from, uh, from an internet connectivity perspective. So I'll open the floor to members of council for questions of clarification on the presentation. Councilor Bateman. Uh, not clarification, just a quick comment. This is exciting for Brighton because it's something we've been pushing for. But in the big picture, it's exciting because if this is successful, what it can do across Ontario, and I know Hydro, uh, One Telecom or acronym could speak to that. This is huge if it works here on some of the places that are really underserved. So this has massive potential. And the, the bonus for Brighton is that we're always going to be attached with that success when it's rolled out to the other communities. 100%. Does anyone from uh, the team have anything to say about that? I would just say that we're equally excited. Um, you know, I know that uh, this has been something that we've also been working really hard on and, and just really appreciate the support um, and uh, very excited about this pilot. Thank you. Anything else from members of council? Council LeBlanc? Thank you, Mayor. One of the, the points when you gave your presentation in April is you ask for uh, assistance from council. Was that for putting in roads or road allowances or something that you needed to put to your, your towers? I will uh, hand it over to Ryan. Is Ryan on the call? You there, Ryan? He's our project manager and have some those types of specific details. If he's not on the call, I'm happy to follow up with that with that answer for you. I think I think primarily it's to make sure that there is a smooth progression and and all of the the boxes Hello. that need to be checked. Oh, is he there? Hello. Go ahead, Ryan. This is Ryan here. Hi there. Yeah, that was. Uh, sorry about that. Um, I was unmuted, but uh, I had to punch in a code here through Zoom. Um, yeah, that was just um, uh, surrounding the support. If if uh, road access was required on any of the sites that um, we couldn't utilize existing um, existing entrances and such, and uh, we are currently currently working on that in the one Brighton division area. If you, you'll you'll work with staff on that one, I assume, Ryan. That's correct. Yes, yes you yes, planning staff on that. Councillor LeBlanc. Issue. I just have a comment. It's not necessarily a question, but in this process of setting, of working with the Rural Broadband Committee, and also going to Enamo and Councillor Bateman, asking questions about how Ontario Hydro was set up, and to find out that you were set up for almost two to three years, and knocking on minister doors trying to get this into the rural area, and they weren't getting any traction, and then we met you in on conference calls in the MPP's chambers, and they were shocked. The Ontario government was shocked to see how advanced that Ontario Hydro was in the hubs and how it was that we met and all the meetings that we had that were organized. So I wanna thank you again for what you did, and I'm glad that Councillor Bateman saw this and could open some of the doors with Mr. Caccini and the mayor and our council, and that you chose us for your, uh, your pilot, but I don't think I gave you too much of a choice for that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Councillor LeBlanc. I won't ask Hydro One team to comment on that. <laughs> Councillor Bateman. Uh, for you, Mayor, would it be safe to assume, I know Mr. Walsh is on the call, because when we had our one there a couple months ago with this group, they were going to be having a technical meeting. So, so my assumption would be all the questions Councillor LeBlanc asked would come in a form of a report for anything that they would need. I'm not sure if they had their technical meeting yet, but I know they were scheduling one. Director Walsh, can you speak to whether the technical meeting has occurred? Uh, sure, Mayor to Council. We did have a, a meeting with uh, with some of the presenters here, and we did discuss whether we would need some municipal consents for any of the works within the municipal 
right of way. So those were the kind of the topics that we covered. And we covered some of the public consultations that uh, might go forward because we do have a bit of a policy or protocol in place for that. And uh, so we thought we might, um, we were open to the idea of having a customized uh, public engagement consultation type program for this project as well. So uh, discussions have to continue on with that to see what options we have there. Thank you, Director. I, I assume it, it's staff. I, I assume staff has an understanding about the importance from a council perspective about this project, and that it will it will be as smooth as, as possible through uh, the staffing levels for Hydro One. Absolutely, staff um, uh, have heard that, and staff uh, are very much uh, in uh, in pace and on side with that sentiment. Thank you, Director. Appreciate that. Any other questions for members of council? Well, Hydro One team, thank you very much. I, I include Harry in that when I say Hydro One team. I hope you know that, Harry. <laughs> thank you for your we're time. All, we're all part of the same family, Hydro One Limited, for sure. Thank you. So with that, I have a motion moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Council LeBlanc, that Council received the presentation from Hydro One Community Relations regarding the broadband pilot in the municipality of Brighton. Is there any further discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Again, with our thanks to the Hydro One team. It brings us to our next presentation from Elaine Chang, partner at SLBC Incorporated, with regard to the 2022 Corporate Asset Management Plan update. And members of council, we fully expect this uh, presentation to go beyond the 15 minute limit that presentations are given in our procedure bylaw. So I won't ask for a formal suspension of the procedure bylaw, but we'll be accommodating of the presenter and uh, allow her to go as long as she needs to within reason, Elaine, <laughs> and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, just for everyone's information, I, I have worked hard to get it down to 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, just for everyone's background, asset management planning is a strategic process that aims to, um, aims to balance levels of service, cost of service and risk for the long term. Um, asset, uh, the asset management plan will help Brighton make well-informed, uh, evidence-based decisions about the municipality's infrastructure assets. It plays a critical role um, in, it plays a critical role, oh, sorry, I'm not even sharing, sorry about that. I need to share before I, I keep going. Um, okay. There we go. That's better. Everyone can see the slides now. We, we can right. see it here in council chambers. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Sorry. Um, and it plays a critical role in defining the line of sight between the organizational strategic priorities and the day to day activities, uh, such as budgeting, uh, capital delivery and operations. It is also uh, becoming increasingly important um, or required by upper levels of government in grant requests. So the asset management plan really is an important document. Um, its importance to our community's uh, future, um, future well-being is, uh, is, the importance is so high that the province has actually um, adopted Ontario Regulation 58817, um, Asset Management Planning for Municipal Infrastructure, which requires municipalities to have uh, asset management plans that define what services they need to deliver with their infrastructure and how they intend to, um, to fund the, the work required to sustain the, that infrastructure. Um, by July 2022, which is this coming July, uh, all municipalities are required to have an asset management plan in place that defines current levels of service for core assets, core assets being roads, bridges, water, wastewater, and stormwater assets. By July 2024, uh, municipalities are required to have asset management plans that cover the remainder of the assets, such as parks and recreation assets, fire service assets, um, building assets, and fleet, fleet assets. The asset management plan that we'll be presenting tonight includes all of the municipality of Brighton's assets, which means that 
um, that it fulfills the requirements of OREG 58817 to July 2024. By July 2025, the OREG requires municipalities to adopt an asset management plan that defines proposed levels of service uh, and, and explains how the municipality intends to um, um, operate, maintain, renew, um, and so on their assets in order to support those proposed levels of service. And that includes all of the municipality's assets. So the, the asset management plan that has been uh, developed for uh, that, that is being presented tonight starts by answering the question, what does the municipality own? Um, the municipality's asset infrastructure has been broken down into um, the eight, uh, into eight core, or not core services, sorry, eight service areas that are listed here with a total replacement value of $416.4 million. So what that number means is that if the municipality had to replace all of its infrastructure assets today, it would cost about $416 million. Um, of course, you wouldn't have to do that. So don't, don't worry about that, but that just gives you an idea of the scale of what you own. Um, and some of the major asset classes are listed on the right. So that includes 234 kilometers of roads, for example, 40 bridges and culverts, uh, 159 kilometers of underground pipes and so on. The next question that the asset management plan answers is what condition are these assets in? And in this graph, we show that 69% um, of the assets are in fair condition or better. 26% um, of the assets are in poor or very poor condition, which is actually um, nothing to worry about. Um, the, this condition profile is extremely, um, it's, it's extremely normal for a municipality and reasonable. Um, the assets in poor condition really just indicate that those assets are at the end of their, are nearing the end of their service life. And it is normal for um, the asset portfolio to include um, a certain number of assets that are nearing the end of their service life. In fact, if you were to replace that uh, replace them before that, you would almost be, uh, you would arguably be aiming for too high a service level. Um, and the, the number of assets in very poor condition, uh, meaning they're beyond their service life, um, is extremely small. And again, that's, um, that's also generally reasonable, um, given that uh, some assets if they're not, if they're not, if they're not critical, you would let them run to failure anyway. So again, this uh, condition profile is quite reasonable. Um, the assets in very poor condition are listed on the right, and they are um, they have been added to the um, to the renewal program, the ten year renewal program. This uh, condition profile graph shows the uh, shows the condition di distribution by service. And um, in, in gray, you can also see there are some assets with unknown condition. Uh, that, uh, as was shown in the previous slide, there were only about 5% um, of, of assets that were in unknown condition, which is an extremely small um, data gap compared to what we've seen in other municipalities. And uh, the, those assets are listed on the right. I just wanna emphasize again, that's, that's quite a small data gap and staff are, already working to fill those data gaps before the next um, asset management plan update. Next, the asset management plan looks at levels of service because of course the assets um, are owned by the municipality uh, specifically to provide services. And so it's really important to define what level of service needs to be provided um, before making any decisions on how to uh, renew or upgrade or expand your, your asset portfolio. Um, the Ontario Regulation 588.17 defines for the core assets, defines specific indicators that must be reported. And it divides those indicators into community levels of service and technical levels of service. Community levels of service are generally uh, maps or descriptions, and technical levels of service are the, um, are the indicators that are more uh, quantitative metrics. So here you see the map, um, the map of the, the, sorry, maps of the road network 
owned by the municipality of Brighton. And on the right, that includes the rural road network. And then uh, on the left, you have a, a zoomed in view of the urban area within the community of Brighton. Um, as I mentioned, the, there are also technical levels of service, which include metrics. The first one, um, quantitative metrics. The first one uh, basically gives you a benchmark of the density of the road network um, in the, as a proportion of the uh, square kilometers of the municipality. Uh, there, are, there are also condition-based indicators that show um, for pavement, uh, surface treated road and gravel road, roads are in very good or good condition on average. Um, similarly for bridges and culverts, those assets are on average in good condition. Um, the OREG also requires reporting on bridges with loading restrictions. And there were two of those out of the, out of the six bridges. Those were Monk Street Bridge and Lord Street Bridge. And both of those are in the capital program um, for Monk Street for uh, uh, rehab and Lord Street Bridge for uh, replacement in uh, 2025. And we also included um, another another metric, which is the percent of assets in fair condition or better. And that just uh, having uh, that type of metric just um, eliminates some of the uh, some of the extremes that get um, that get uh, obscured in, in, in presenting only the average condition. So here we see that 58% of the assets are in fair condition or better. For um, the stormwater system, uh, you see here the, a map of the stormwater system, which is limited to the, uh, the urban area of the community of Brighton. And that makes sense because the rural area has a lot more um, uh, pervious, um, porous surface. So there isn't really as much necessity for sto um, stormwater infrastructure in the rural areas. So this shows the, as I said, the. Uh, the, the pipe network. And then in terms of technical levels of service, 84.2% of properties uh, in, in Brighton are resilient to a hundred year storm. And 100% um, and of the municipal stormwater system, which is the pipe network you see here, is resilient to a five year storm. 71% uh, of the assets are in fair condition or better. The water system map is shown here. And again, this, um, this water system is limited to the urban area within the community of Brighton. And in terms of technical levels of service, 53% of the municipality's properties are, uh, are connected to the water system. And so those 53% of properties are within that, that urban area. Uh, 57% are considered to have fire flow. And in this case, we measured that uh, based on who has, based on proximity to um, fire hydrants. In, in the future though, this metric will be reported based on um, uh, hydraulic modeling that will be done using the new, uh, the hydraulic model that was recently developed uh, by the municipality. Um, in terms of boil water advisories, there were none in the study period, which was 2018 to 2020. And in terms of uh, water main breaks, there were some interruptions, um, most notably seven water main breaks were reported along Main Street from, um, uh, from Ontario to the westerly boundary of the municipality. And this analysis, uh, this a preliminary version of this analysis, along with a draft of this section, was provided in in a grant request, and so funding has been received to replace that um, to replace that water main, and the design uh, the design work will begin this summer. Um, and in, in terms of uh, percent assets in fair condition or better, it's quite high for water, which is normal. It's 93%. It's normal because most municipalities have pretty rigorous um, uh, drinking water quality management system processes in place. And in the last, or in the three year study period, there were no water, um, water related complaints except for one in 2018, which was a low pressure complaint that was related to a, an outage at the Dundas uh, pumping station. And this, uh, this map shows the wastewater network. Again, um, it's limited to the community, the urban area in the community of Brighton. 
Um, in the community levels of service also require uh, some discussion about uh, how stormwater can get into sanitary sewers because that takes up capacity. And um, as with most municipalities, inflow and infiltration is, um, is an issue and the municipality has implemented a, or has initiated a multi-year program to, um, to manage uh, and mitigate this, this problem. 53% of the properties in the municipality are, um, are connected to the wastewater system. Again, those, those properties are within the urban area. Uh, in 2020, there were two wastewater system uh, backups resulting in two connection days lost. And uh, there's, we've listed here some effluent violations um, over the past few years and the municipality has uh, has initiated a multi-year $8 million um, program to, uh, to reduce ammonia at the, um, at the water pollution control plant. For, waste, for the wastewater system, 49% of assets are in fair condition or better. For the remainder of the services which, um, for which assets are considered non-core, the Ontario regulation doesn't, uh, doesn't define indicators that must be reported. So the remainder of the indicators were developed uh, with uh, input from staff and in consideration of, um, of what is important to the municipality. So for parks and recreation, um, the, the number of hectares of parkland is 6.34 hectares. Uh, number of residents per recreation building is uh, more than 2,300. Um, and then the municipality is also tracking safety incidents related to indoor and outdoor recreation assets, as well as complaints related to parks and recreation assets. Um, and, our, and in terms of assets in fair condition or better, there are uh, not, it's quite high at 93%. For fire protection, 100% of the equipment meets um, National Fire Protection Association standards and 75% of our assets are in fair condition or better. Um, in health services, 99.7% of assets are in fair condition or better. And this includes, um, this metric includes only the Brighton Health Center because the second building hadn't been um, purchased yet uh, when we did this analysis. And in terms of municipal administration assets, 96.5% uh, of assets are in fair condition or better. Um, for, for this asset management plan, as I mentioned, the OREG, uh, Ontario regulation does not require the municipality to set targets, level of service targets. Uh, the idea is that the municipality will um, track these metrics for a few years and understand uh, how what the cost is of um, of delivering this service level and determine determine whether these um, whether these are appropriate service levels or whether they need to be raised or lowered and what would that cost uh, what would that cost be so these are really setting sort of a benchmark for future asset management plans. So uh, the next section of the asset management plan looks at what improvements are needed over the next 10 years. And these improvements were gathered from strategic documents. And uh, for example, the, uh, the council's strategic, uh, strategic plan, you'll recognize some items from there like the construction of overpass underpass at John Street, the connecting link, um, and also, um, also capacity studies that were done on the system. So uh, where water main expansions were, were needed and where um, a new water well is, was identified as a need. There, we've also included in this, um, in, in this list, the work on the water pollution control plant for ammonia removal, um, upgrade of Harbor Street sewage pumping station, construction of the new parks and rec facility and a new fire and ambulance station, as well as uh, general growth planning studies and the implementation of the enterprise asset management system. So those needs, um, and, and there were other um, others also, but those were the, the major categories. Uh, those, those upgrade and expansion needs total 58.6 million over the next 10 years, which um, as an annual average is about five, uh, 5.9 million per year. 
And um, in addition, we also have to think about renewal of existing assets. So here, what we did was we looked at the inventory and forecasted out uh, when, when, different, when each individual asset would need to be uh, rehabbed or replaced. And the total need over the next 10 years for these assets was $104.6 million. So that, that, um, that gives us an annual average of about $10.5 million per year. So if we put that together with what we saw on the previous slide, um, it's, about, um, it's about $16 million um, per year for these, these capital uh, expansion, upgrade and renewal. Uh, needs. Uh, we also look at the operations and maintenance costs, and um, and the uh, what we uh, we started with the 2021 budget amount as um, as a as a starting point, and staff indicated at that time that the 8.6 million dollars per year was sufficient to deliver serv um, service levels, expected service levels for the um, asset inventory at that time. Uh, with the exception of an, a need of about $50,000 per year for, uh, for CCTV program for stormwater assets. Um, and then, and then um, we also estimated the additional funds needed to manage growth assets, meaning um, the operations and maintenance costs associated with new roads, sidewalks, parks, um, storm ponds uh, and and water wastewater and stormwater pipes that you would be taking on um, every year and so that we forecasted out that uh, that growth amount based on historical growth so you can see um, in the last column about how uh, how the about the quantity um, that would be taken on each year and what in the second last column you see the estimated cost impact to the operations um, the operating budget that would be. So uh, that totals about $48,000 per year. Oh, sorry. So putting all of that together, uh, we have this financial forecast that looks out 10 years. The first three columns show the, um, show the historical from 2018 to 2020. At the time we did the analysis, uh, we were working with the 2021 budget amount. And then um, in, in general, the green, the green portions of the bars represent uh, operating costs, uh, forecast operating needs, which were about, um, so as we discussed about $9 million a year, increasing about $48,000 per year uh, to accommodate growth assets. In blue, we have the, in blue, we have the um, expansion and upgrade need, which was about $5.9 million per year. And then in yellow, we have the renewal need, which was about $10.5 million per year. So the red, um, the red line represents the total annual need um, for, for life cycle costs of your infrastructure. And that total is about $25.3 million um, in 2022 and increasing slightly again for those growth assets to $25.7 million per year by 2031. Um, if we look at the uh, past, uh, the historical spending and budget from 2020, uh, sorry, 2018 to 2021, the annual average expenditures were about $18.1 million per year. So um, what this graph is showing is that that leaves a, a funding gap um, if we were to assume that we would continue on the current um, funding, um, funding trend that would leave a funding gap of about $7.3 million per year. And um, again, this is, uh, this is quite a common phenomenon that, um, that is observed in most municipalities and is the reason that the province and the um, federal government have been uh, so, uh, have placed so much importance on municipalities having an asset management plan was uh, specifically to daylight the, these infrastructure gaps um, and to encourage intergenerational equity because um, these infrastructure funding gaps, basically the longer we leave them, the more we, uh, the more uh, of, of this um, gap is left to future generations to address. So um, some ways of, uh, of addressing the um, infrastructure gap 
include adjusting life cycle strategies. So, um, so re adopting strategies that would sort of space out renewal needs um, and, and thus reduce the, the life cycle cost. Adjusting service level standards, potentially reducing service levels and uh, deferring work by prioritizing uh, high and very high risk um, work on high and very high risk assets. Keeping in mind that the longer we defer work, um, the more we push that out to future generations. Um, and of course, there are there's the revenue side that we can look at to uh, to close that inf infrastructure gap, and that is that includes raising revenues through taxes, user rates, um, development charges, stormwater or infrastructure levies, and uh, and seeking uh, more grants. So, um, so as I mentioned earlier, this asset management plan that we just presented fulfills the requirements to July 2024. The next uh, uh, OREG requirements to keep an eye on are, um, the, of, are incorporating proposed levels of service into the asset management plan for all assets by July 1st, 2025. Um, and then thereafter, the asset management plan will have to be updated at least every five years. In the meantime, the asset management plan uh, progress needs to be reported to council annually by July 1st. Asset management um, planning is a, is, a, uh, is a journey where um, the asset management plan itself should evolve and improve with each iteration. And part of that improvement, uh, the, the municipality has already taken on by uh, initiating an enterprise asset management system. This will be one of the core systems to, um, that the municipality has to, to manage work orders and track life cycle costs to individual assets um, and, and thereby um, really support your evidence-based um, evidence well-informed decision-making. And that system will also uh, facilitate and streamline your, um, your asset management planning and forecasting activities. In, uh, in, 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 um, in integrated with that is um, the need for data improvements and the municipality, as I mentioned, has already started working on data improvements uh, toward, uh, first of all, the enterprise asset management system implementation, as well as uh, looking forward to the next update of the asset management plan. Um, another, another thing that the uh, municipality can start working on right away is um, working to establish level of service targets for that 2025 asset management plan and thinking about how to uh, engage the public in setting appropriate targets, um, level of service targets for that 2025 asset management plan. And finally, uh, as, you, as you continue to work on asset management, um, more needs and, and improvement opportunities will be identified. So it'll be really important to centralize and, and prioritize those needs so that uh, they, can be, they can be tackled in a strategic and coordinated way um, to, benefit, to best benefit the entire organization. Uh, so that was, the presentation of the asset management plan. And before I uh, break off, I just wanted to thank you again for having us here to present this and especially to the staff for their, uh, for their deep insights and all their support in developing this asset management plan. Thank you, Ms. Chang. We appreciate you uh, coming and delivering this information to us. It can be, uh, it can be weighty to, uh, <laughs> to realize that we are, we are behind, but it's comforting sadly, to know that uh, we're not alone in this journey and that uh, mm -hmm. um, municipalities from coast to coast and quite frankly around the world are struggling with, with these levels of, uh, of, of assets and, and replacement levels. I'll open the floor to members of council for questions of clarification on the presentation. There are none noted. So again, thank you very, oh, Councillor Tadman. Um, Ms. Shank. I like bottom line figures and uh, um, just uh, maybe a word of encouragement to the residents that um, as I read this off and on all day today and uh, my, my bottom line as I saw it all is that 
for the most part, the municipality through the years has, has done a pretty good job at looking after infrastructure. And I just wondered if you would comment on that and maybe give us a A to E <laughs> score. Sure. Um, I think um, I think you're in a good position for, um, as I said, um, I think you're you're comparable with many municipalities, and um, I think you're in a good position for um, for the for the for the near term. What becomes um, a concern is the is sort of the the especially the long term sustainability and the intergenerational equity, um, which is. Uh, the idea that the longer we the longer we put off work, the more we shift that um, that burden to our children, um, and that's that's really uh, that's really what we're trying to avoid. Um, I'm just gonna um, I'm gonna uh, invite my uh, colleague Amin, um, who is uh, who is a principal at our firm. Um, he has he also has a lot of experience. Uh, with asset management plans, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, Elaine. Um, I, I would say, generally speaking, the best way to look at an infrastructure gap is the gap per capita, because different municipalities of different sizes will have different gaps. Um, in terms of gross numbers, I agree with Elaine. <clears throat> the municipalities' um, infrastructure gap is not uh, I would say in a, a terrible position compared to your peers. I think you're among the few municipalities who have the opportunity to stay ahead of the game and you have some runway uh, given your current position to plan for the future and control that infrastructure gap. We've done work with larger regions and cities who have had to do 9% increases for five or seven years and then get down to five or 6% increases for five to seven years just to catch up. And their infrastructure gaps uh, are, are still in a, a worse position than yours are currently. So um, I'd be hesitant to give you a, a rating. Uh, you know, if, if you press me for one, I might say you're a, a B plus uh, in terms of um, uh, where you are. I think uh, Elaine highlighted a number of great opportunities that you have in terms of good data. You have a system coming in place. Your infrastructure is in relatively good condition. So 58% of your overall assets are in fair or better condition, which means you do have some runway to get ahead of that. I, I hope that answered your question. It's very difficult to grade you uh, when you're comparing the infrastructure gap, primarily because Different municipalities are in different phases. Some of them have very old infrastructure. Some of them are focused on renewal. Some of them are focused on expansion. So it's very difficult to do a comparable rating, if you will. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'll take that B plus. I haven't had many B pluses in my life and I've <laughs> sat around this table for a long time. So I, I think overall um, we, we could at least pat ourselves gently on, on the back to say that uh, we are working. And the other thing that uh, uh, I just want to bring up at this time, there's, there's such a thing as uh, uh, um, needs and, and things that maybe are wish lists. And I noticed the one there for 20 million for the recreation center sure puts a heavy weight on, on the, the taxpayers. So that's something that I think really needs to be discussed with all the residents. But other than that, uh, I mean, all the other things have to be done anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much again. Uh, we do appreciate it. I know you were uh, reluctant to give us a grade, um, uh, but in the world of, uh, of, of infrastructure, debt and deficit and asset management, we'll take a B plus any day. So we, we do appreciate you coming, but we pre more importantly, we appreciate the information and it will help us go down a road strategically uh, as, we, as we meander the asset management world. So thank you again. And with that, I have a motion moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Councilor LeBlanc. The Council received the presentation from Elaine Chang, partner SLBC Incorporated, regarding the 2022 Corporate Asset Management Plan update. Is there any further discussion? Those in favor? Any opposed? The motion's carried. Thank you again for coming. Thank you so much.
now we move into citizens comment. Um, I, yeah, we, the clerk's office has received a citizens comment from someone who can't be present or zoom in and I will read that but if there's anyone present in the chamber who has a citizens comment, I'd ask you to approach the microphone. Are we aware of anyone joining us on zoom it doesn't look like it Thank you. So citizen comment comes from David Green on agenda item 9.10 organizational review. And it reads, members of council met with the CAO and refined reduced the scope of work for this RFP. I don't know how much work was removed, but the fact remains that the charge from KPMG was reduced by a mere $16,000 to a still outrageous cost of $94,000. The less scope of work is certainly not reflected in this minuscule reduction in costs. To what point? It's now June 6th. You are deemed a lame duck council in early August. It is not feasible that the interviews, analysis, and presentation to council will occur in time for any action to be taken and to what avail. KPMG quoted 360 person hours. The window for you to act is rapidly closing. You have not satisfied me or other members of the public that a problem exists. What is the proposed outcome? Council has one direct report. What will you accomplish? You may have the power to legislate this proposal, but you shouldn't have the conscience to approve this expense. Unless you want your legacy to be seen as wasteful spenders of $94,000 un of unbudgeted public funds in your last months on council, after all the good work that's been accomplished over the past four years, please be sensible and responsible and do not vote in favor of this motion. You always have the option of running for re-election and introducing this study during budget considerations next year, the proper way to consider an expense. Thank you, David Green. And that is the only citizen's comment that the clerk's office received this uh, this week. And with that, I have a motion moved by Council Tadman, seconded by Council Bateman. The council received the citizens comments submitted at the June 6, 2022 council meeting. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. That brings us to staff reports. Uh, first report comes from the clerk's office, council planning meeting dates in August, 2022. Uh, Deputy Clerk, we've read the clerk's report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Nothing at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. The council received the staff report regarding council planning meeting schedule for August 2022, and the council approve altering the council meeting dates for August to the following, August 22nd for council, August 24th for planning, and further that staff be directed to advertise the changes. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next report also comes from the clerk's office, the naming of corporate assets, Queen Elizabeth II Park. It's moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tad. Oh, sorry. Deputy Clerk, we've read the clerk's report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Nothing at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. The council received the staff report regarding the naming of corporate assets, the naming of the park on Daniels Drive in recognition of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee as Queen Elizabeth II Park, and that council approved the naming of the park on Daniels Drive in recognition of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee as Queen Elizabeth II Park upon approval from the Governor General's office. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Next report, report is regarding parking lot paving at King Edward Park. Um, Mr. Miller, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Just that irregardless of the high cost, um, the solution we're proposing is the one that will look after the front part as well as the drainage. That seems to have been a, a problem uh, for many years there. Thank you for that information. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council accepts the report from the Director of Parks and Recreation and awards a reduced scope of work from tender REC 2022-04 to Earth Crete, Earth Crete Ontario Incorporated for a total project cost to the municipality of $149,069.52, financed through both the 2022 Parks and Recreation Capital Budget and from the Municipal Parks Parks Reserve funds. Is there any discussion? Councillor Anderson. 
Uh, just one for the director. Um, the east side was originally going to be partly done as well, right? And so what is the importance of that in the near future to be done or can we live with it? Mr. Miller? I think it's some. I think it's something that's going to need to be done in the future, but at this point in time, it's not deemed as essential. This part that we're, we highlighted now is one that needs to be done. It's a, it's a safety risk. I agree. Issue. I know you've get, in your report you mentioned that you discussed or you yeah. considered all all avenues, but uh, with the cost of inflation and everything, I, if it was in the next year or two, I'd be pressed to be thinking about moving ahead sooner than later on it because it'll the way this has gone up in price i would imagine we're going to be looking at another major expense for that true but you know who knows in the future we might be able to get some funding okay i like that word so <laughs> so with that i thank you for your answer <laughs> thank you deputy mayor um, thank you. And I'm not sure if there's an answer to this question, but just a concern that uh, if we're looking at an increase here, are there other projects that we have on the go for this year that haven't been yet uh, sent out that uh, could be affected by these price increases? Good point. Uh, I don't think the director should answer that, but Mr. B Mr. Castleman, do you have a, an answer to that? Where are we at in the sort of tender schedule, I think is the question. Sure. Uh, so uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we're trying to get out to, uh, the various tenders uh, as quick as we can. As you know, we get through the budget process early, so that afforded us the opportunity to get tenders and RFPs out uh, to the public uh, fairly quickly. Um, time is gonna tell. Uh, we have a variety of them closing. Uh, um, about half of them have remained within budget. Some of them are uh, significantly higher and we'll adjust just as we've adjusted on this tender and bring forward uh, reasonable recommendations to get uh, as much work done as we can. Thank you for that. Councilor Rowley? Uh, no, my question was answered by Councilor Anderson. Thank you. Thank you. And just uh, you know, a quick note, we are running at 7% roughly or 7% inflation and the construction price index is running around 17%. So these, these increased costs are not terribly surprising. Unfortunate, but not terribly surprising. Anything further on the motion? Those in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next report is with regard to the Codrington Community Center report. Director Whittefield, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council receives the Codrington Community Centre report as information. Is there any discussion? Those in favour? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Next report is with regard to the Canada Special Operations Regiment. Mr. Blatansky, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Not at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. The council authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute a lease agreement between the municipality of Brighton and the Canada Special Operations Regiment for the use of Hilton Hall for military training operations. Any questions or comments from members of council? Deputy Mayor. Um, being on the Heritage Committee, um, we've put a lot of time and energy into this, this building and maintaining it. I just want to make sure that uh, we continue to maintain it. It is, it is a heritage building. It has great value to the community. Any comment, Mr. Blatansky? Through you, Your Worship, uh, yes, indeed. Um, it's a two-day uh, meet scenario, so we'll do everything we can, absolutely. Thank you for that. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. The next uh, report is with regard to our boundary road agreement with the city of Quinney West. Mr. Blatensky, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Not at this time. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman, the staff 
request council's consideration to adopt the revised boundary agreement between the municipality of Brighton and the city of Quinty West with the understanding that Brighton will maintain portions of the mutual boundary roads that border the Qu with Quinty West. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Thank you to staff for getting us here in with, uh, with that agreement. The next one is uh, the 2022 Corporate Asset Management Plan update. Mr. Gooding, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? No, I do not. Thank you. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc, that Council adopts the 2022 Corporate Asset Management Plan update. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next report is with regard to enterprise asset management software solution. Mr. Gooding, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? Uh, yes, the the recommendation has a, uh, a report has a an attachment that was not included and that was an error in, in the recommendation or in the report um, saying that there's an attachment that there is not. So it notes that there's an attachment. There is in fact not an attachment and that's why we didn't get an attachment. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Gooding. Thanks. <laughs> I have a motion to move by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Councillor LeBlanc, that Council award the Enterprise Asset Management Software Solution contract to PSD Citywide Incorporated in the amount of $160,885, inclusive of the expense portion of HST. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Next report is the 2022 Department Work Plans first quarter report. Mr. Castleman, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight, sir? Uh, for you, Mr. Mayor, just a couple of highlights. Uh, um, certainly uh, staff have been very active with respect to trying to pursue various sources of funding and uh, pleased to announce that uh, we have been successful on a number of different fronts. Certainly, uh, we have a major roofing project that's ongoing right now. We received about $400,000 or so. Uh, the second uh, major grant that we received was uh, relating to the uh, water main replacement from uh, Ontario Street. It's along Main Street and from Ontario out to the Western Boundary. It's a, a project valued at about um, $2.9 million or so. We received uh, approximately $2.15 million in funding. Uh, so that's a very exciting project, uh, much needed for the community that was identified within our asset, uh, asset management plan. I think the other, uh, the other uh, important initiative is that uh, we're getting on with the Lagoon project. It's been a lingering project and uh, we've been in front of council and the community over the course of the last number of years. We've retained RV Anderson to uh, take us through a, a, a revised EA process. That uh, um, uh, project has commenced. We had a kickoff meeting on May 26th and there are going to be some public notices uh, going out shortly and the public is going to have uh, various opportunities to comment as we go through that process. We're hoping to uh, uh, end the EA process within about a three month period or so. So those are a few of the highlights for uh, council and the community for the first uh, first quarter. Thank you, CAO. I have a motion moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Council LeBlanc, that council received the 2022 first quarter work plan report for information. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Next report is with regard to the organizational review RFP CAO 2022. Mr. Castleman, we've uh, we've read your report. Do you have anything to add or highlight? Uh, the 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 highlight uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, is uh, we've uh, gone through the process of narrowing the scope of work. I've worked closely with uh, uh, Councillor Rowley over the course of the last uh, few weeks and uh, had many discussions with uh, with KPMG, and they provided us with a proposal late last week. And I've appended that to um, um, 
to this report, the major changes and the narrowing of the scope of the of work has uh, been primarily with the number of interviews that uh, we had originally uh, contemplated. We thought we were going to uh, interview everybody on staff and those who had left, totaling about 125 people or so. We've since refined that to about 50, and that has had a direct reduction in the uh, number of hours associated with the uh, program. So there's a slight uh, adjustment in, uh, in the cost. It's still an unbudgeted item, as you know. Uh, so uh, looking forward to council's decision-making tonight and getting on the project, getting on with the project, should you so choose. Thank you, CAO. I have a motion moved by Councillor LeBlanc, seconded by Councillor Rowley. The council authorized the mayor and clerk to execute a contract with KPMG for the completion of an organizational review as depicted in schedule one attached here too and further that the source of funding for this contract is through the contingency reserve. Any questions or comments from members of council? Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> uh, yes, I did have um, a couple of meetings with uh, the CA over this. And although in some points I agree with uh, Mr. Green, the price tag still seems very high for uh, what I hoped would have been expected from, uh, from this um, review. Uh, I'm still uh, in favor of moving this forward. Um, reading the last page from one of the partners, uh, once we go through this, is there still opportunity, Mr. Castleman, as far as if we sit down that some of the, some of the ideas can still be uh, narrowed a little bit more? CAO? Uh, the, the, the quick answer is absolutely. Uh, uh, can we have a further refinement of the scope of work during the... Uh, initial kickoff meeting or get together? The answer is absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bateman. Uh, just along that line, so if there's down the road further narrowing, does that mean they're willing to adjust the cost of this? You can narrow the scope all you want. We were talking about the price tag. Once, once we execute the agreement, we, we may very well be on the hook for the price that's in front of us, but CAO, I'll get you to comment. Well, I, I have three years, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would expect in the normal course, if there's a significant re reduction in the scope of work, there would be an adjustment in the price accordingly. Anything further from members of council? Councilor Anderson? Uh, just would like to be sure that we're not just grooming this to do it. Uh, the, the, the amount of money is uh, uh, horrendous right now compared to what we what we're going to as far as you know this is ninety four thousand dollars 50 people to be interviewed that's 50 people not doing working uh, attending this is the 50 interviews aren't part of the ninety four thousand dollars i presume no i would i would presume they are part of the ninety four thousand dollars yeah oh it's incorporated in the yeah. the cost to k so the, our employees that are being interviewed um are being paid out of the, this 94,000. No, so I see what you're asking. That's no. my point. Yes. The salary costs are not included and, in this. And That's folks correct. that don't work for us anymore that left and left and did have a, a exit interview, um, if they come back, I, I guess it will be on their own free and on their time. Um, there's not gonna be any consideration for any of that, depending where they live and that type of thing. Um, I, th I can see this going on. Uh, I think Mr. Green made some valid points about the, the time element of it. Um, I think the element of it, getting a decision on this is gonna be, isn't gonna, we're not gonna be able to do anything or, or we may not even get it this term anyhow. So, um, cause that's a lot of, it's still a lot of people to interview and make schedule and to get this done for $94,000. I don't, I don't feel comfortable that that's even going to happen. So I'm not going to see, I still don't, I still, I, I agree with your point of trying to get this to a workable level. It's not at a workable level in this, in this year, I think it's a, a, a burden on the taxpayer that we don't need to do. And I think uh, and we're waiting still for another report from the CAO on, 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 uh, on, um, the work that he's doing to find uh, we've been pushing on that and know it's coming so i'm not going to push here for it but 
that should give us some results. And I don't know why we can't get key answers on exit interviews uh, without hiring somebody to go do exactly that. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're getting somebody else to get those, get that information. And I think the information is sitting in one of our files somewhere. And what, what the legalities of us getting that information, uh, I guess there is, but we're going to get it somewhere because that's what this is all about is get some answers. So the answers I believe are sitting somewhere without us spending all this money and time to, to, to get them. So I, I'm not gonna support it still. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. So when we reduced from 125 interviews to 50, we only reduced the price by uh, what, 15, 15,000 or so. Uh, I just don't think that we're going to get the scope of work down to what perhaps um, the desire is. And I don't see the purpose in it. We do have exit interviews as Councillor Anderson uh, said, and we've been told uh, when, when possible, we've actually been told um, why. Um, members have, have left and we understand those reasons. So um, when it, the time comes, if uh, I would like to ask for a recorded vote. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I will ask the Deputy Clerk for a recorded vote when the time comes. Councilor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Anderson, everything costs us money. The fact that we have gaps in our management team costs us a lot of money too. And I'm sure 94,000, it was gonna take a little bit more of that to fill gaps that we have at this stage of the game. Uh, as we've been told before, without going into a lot of discussion, when we've been asking for answers regarding exit interviews, we haven't been given really very many minimal, minimal details. Um, I, my questions are still the same. Is this just Brighton? Are we the only ones going through all of these uh, exit interviews or folks going out the door? That also costs us a lot of money. Uh, whether we get this done before lame duck or late in the fall, it will certainly be something that can guide the next council as well to see uh, how we can um, Im improve and retain uh, staff that we that we need that we need now. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Tadman? I, I just take objection to the the, the, the wording that it, this is. It's a horrendous amount. It's a horrendous amount when we when we constantly are advertising in the paper and I get the comments all the time, you know, what's going on in this municipality? It seems every time I open the paper, there's, there's more um, uh, ads for, for new people. Um, and it costs a lot of money to, tr to bring somebody into the municipality. And sometimes they leave before they hard. I, I haven't even seen them. Some of these people have come and gone and I wouldn't, be able to identify them. So I think there's a problem. And I think that we need to, whether it's for this council, not necessarily everything will come forward, but as we move forward, let's, let's, if there's a problem, let's find out what it is. Thank you. Anything further? Councilor Bateman? Uh, just from the, for the CAO clarification, you said it was narrowed down to 50. Does that include, like, I think the original motion asked for extra reviews on it, people that had left the municipality. So that's including them. And who else is part of that 50? CAO? Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, so certainly uh, it includes those who wish to participate, who have resigned. Uh, it includes uh, all of council, all of senior staff, and a representative uh, uh, group uh, of each of the departments, uh, both non-union and union. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the breakdown of the 50. Does that answer your question, sir? Does it still, because I think at one point, the intent was to interview whoever sitting around here wanted to interview. So does that 50 include any participating members of council? It includes all members of council, I think is what I heard the CAO say. Is that correct, CAO? That's correct. Anything further from members of council? Councilor LeBlanc? Yes, uh, thank you for calling, calling for a recording vote, Deputy Mayor. I was gonna do the same. The thing is, is that this is a hard decision. Probably should have done, been done in the past. I'm gonna run. If I don't get reelected, at least I've done something for it because this has to be addressed for future councils. What is going on? When we got here, it was training and we weren't paying enough. So, We've hired a bunch more. 
We've had all the, all the studies done to bring their pay up, to get their training up, and they're still not staying. Could be for more money, could be hiring here, could be disappointment, but we have to find out why. If we're gonna have a good workforce and a task force, we gotta, we gotta find out why. And so I'm in favor of it. Councilor Anderson? Uh, Doug, I believe we have that information. That's what I said. And I believe we don't need to go through this process to get that information and, and, and uh, the responsible people led by our CAO can take care of the take care of business. Um, the other thing is we are right now working hard to uh, recruit uh, and we're working hard for retention, I believe. Uh, we talked about that recently. Um, well, well, we haven't given it a chance. Uh, we, it's not working because some of this is snagging it, I think. I think if this, if this carries on for the next three months, or two months, let's just say two months, they're really effective and get all these interviews done and get the report done. And we're recruiting and we're trying to run a municipality here. Uh, I, I think the morale and everything's just, uh, and it's gonna be a tough job to do all, everything that we wanna do is gonna be tough. I think we did excellent up until this point. I agree that there's things where we hired excellent people, um, but they've left for different reasons and 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 and, and similar to other communities why people are and they're still leaving if you look around the, the region it's they're still knocking on uh, leaving and knocking on other communities doors so and and you were at the conferences we all heard what everybody was having the same problems but there, we have isolated ones i'm sure and that's what you're trying to drill you're trying to drill down to some isolated situations is, is that going to be effective is that going to solve our problems It'll at least know where we're heading, I guess, is what we're in. And, 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 I, and I, I'd like to concur with you all that it's probably uh, something that we, we need to all know. But I, not, I, don't still, I still don't think that uh, we, we need to go out on, on a limb and do all this right now and, uh, and spend this kind of money. So, and, and I know your point, Councillor, uh, regarding uh, it costs money to uh, hire people, train people. Uh, orientation, all those things. I know all those things. And, and, and however, uh, we can't be using that. You know, it, it's up to us to manage the municipality and uh, without talking about spending money for all these things. But we're spending it here. We're spending unbudgeted money. So and we just went through that uh, big, uh, our, um, our, our management and uh, program there. And we got a long way to go of spending money. And, and, and I'll just touch on one thing. We've been a good, uh, a, a good council when we were budgeting and we were looking ahead and we were saying, we can't hold back on getting some of these things done. And I know you counselor, you, uh, you said, we got to get those roads done. We got to get that done. And we didn't hold back, but we, it got close that we held back, but we can't, we can't be spending money that we don't have. Thank you for that. Any anything further? Oh, I, I will offer a correction. We 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 do not manage the municipality as council. We are we are Did here I to govern. We I mean, you, you, you said yeah, we're here to manage the municipality. Yeah, yeah. We're here to govern and set yeah. good policies so that senior staff can I manage. Used, the municipality. I used the wrong word. You, you did, and that's why I wanted to make sure that it was correct. Yeah. Councilor Tadman get on with this i think we're just spinning our wheels yeah thank you for that um we are getting on with it that's what debate is all about anything further from members of council council Bateman. i've heard a couple times this evening and in the past because we've been talking about this well for me since february 22nd i think it was first tabled in january that we have the information but the information hasn't been presented you know, I, I've heard we've had some exit interviews and you can't force somebody to do it, but that information, I don't know if we're entitled to see them, but we keep hearing that we have them. And here we are months later, but and I keep hearing about the cost and the cost of recruitment, but the one cost that we're not talking about, the cost of attrition far outweighs the cost of recruitment. You can replace a position, you can replace a body in a position, but you can't replace the knowledge that goes with some of those positions. So I know this number looks like a big number, but we've had some employees leave and I don't want to speak for anybody else here, but I, I think what they're saying is 
some of the knowledge that went out the door, you can replace person in this role, but you cannot replace their experience. You can have somebody straight out of university with more degrees than any of us combined, but you can't replace that knowledge. And that's what we have been losing with some of the people that we have seen leave. Thank you. Anything further from members of council? I have to say I was enthused when I saw the number of interviews drop uh, to below half of the original request and was looking forward to seeing a number that was much more glowing than the one we see in front of us. I am worried that um, we've dropped over half of the interviews uh, and we've only um, we've only shaved off about 16, 15 or 16 grand. So that's that's concerning. One, one question tonight was, is, is this just happening in Brighton? Well, we know it's not. There are 444,000 jobs go unfilled across the province of Ontario every day. We're in a global labor shortage. We know that to be true. And we are not the only ones who have ads every week for recruitment. It's all of our neighboring municipalities are doing it. All of the regional governments are doing it. The county levels are doing it. And most of the people around us pay more than we do. That's, that's a simple reality because they're bigger. Quinney West pays more, Belleville pays more, the county pays more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, um, all said, Madam Clerk, a recorded vote has been requested by the deputy mayor. Votes are done in alphabetical order, starting with the person who, accept, who requested the vote, which is Deputy Mayor Connect, ending with me. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Connect? Uh, no. Councillor Ron Anderson? No. Councillor Mark Bateman? Yes. Councillor Doug LeBlanc. Yes. Councillor Emily Rowley. Yes. Councillor, Councillor Mary Tadman. Yes. Mayor Brian Ostrander. No. So we have four votes for and three against. Passed. Thank you, everyone. That takes us to notice of motions and motions. The first motion comes forward from the May 16th, 2022 meeting, and it's moved by Councilor Bateman, seconded by Councilor LeBlanc, whereas the planning department report dated December 13th, 2021, assessed several strategies for promoting affordable housing. And whereas the evaluation concluded that a land banking program was a preferred program over the long term. And whereas Council Resolution CPL 2021-153, included item number three stating that staff be directed to research land securement for the purpose of supplying affordable housing. Now therefore be it resolved, the staff are requested to report to council on first steps to establishing a land banking program that supports an affordable housing supply and other possible land use initiatives. Any questions or comments from members of council? Councilor Bateman. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the director of uh, planning, Mr. Walsh, as uh, we spoke a couple of times or several times about the land banking. And if I can get you, Mr. Walsh, if you could speak to, because we both researched uh, Red Deer, Alberta, and they have been quite successful in land banking. And if you'd be kind enough, explain it to those here and those that might be listening. And if I'm not mistaken, I think, I don't, I can't remember how many years they've been doing it, but not only they have been successful in, you know, growing their community the way they want it to grow because they have control of that. They've also, been able to put $38 million into their municipal coffers. So. Director Walsh, before you do that, Director, I'm going to note that uh, Councillor Tadman um, left the meeting at 8.08 p.m. and returned at 8.10 p.m. Director, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, the Council. Um, the land banking programs aren't anything too new out west. There's a number of cities or regions that currently practice land banking programs, and the one that I was vaguely familiar with was the Red Deer program. They've had that uh, in course for uh, many years since about, well, since the 1920s I've since learned. And 
that was largely because I inherited a lot of land during the depression and that sort of thing, but they've continued on that program to today. And the senior management team had a, a Zoom call with the manager of the land banking program from Red Deer, John Senema, and he gave us some background on how the, that program currently works. And it, it works alongside with, the, with uh, the general development community, simply offering alternatives uh, in uh, the housing form. And it uh, creates a little more choice of the, uh, uh, to the community of the housing that's applied and ends up being uh, also a little bit more affordable, uh, although that's not just the main target. Uh, I guess historically, um, my mentor, the fellow who hired me many years ago originally, he had been the director of planning for their tri-county area of Red Deer, and, and he was very enamored with, uh, with their land banking program, was very successful during his tenure there. And that was during the, the, the 60s and 70s. And so basically, the, it's pretty simple. The municipality uh, acquires land or options land, uh, lays down a plan, and then uh, tenders out the building lots or blocks. And they do it in small pieces so that it allows for a market entry point for uh, the smaller contractor. And uh, that way, there's um, a good choice and competition in the market uh, and they provide a little bit more affordability along, along the way. But like I say, it's not the uh, chief uh, objective. That land banking program also not only looks at housing, but it also looks at industrial land and Forest Municipality of Brighton has a, a land banking program for its industrial park. So essentially we're already doing that uh, of, of sorts. And now it might be useful to turn our minds towards doing something similar for, for housing, particularly because of the uh, affordability crisis that we're now facing. Um, there's other places that uh, uh, do uh, their land banking program a little bit differently. The city of Saskatoon has a very successful program. Uh, a number of other places in the Western provinces uh, seems to have a, that bit of a, a focus. Not so common in Ontario, but I'm lear learning that number of municipalities are also turning their mind to land banking programs for the first time in Ontario, kind of following the Western lead in that regard. Um, so what we're hearing is it's been very successful over a period of time, as uh, Councillor Bateman indicated, about, about a $36 million um, uh, supply of revenue. I think that was over about 16 years that that was realized and Red Deer is about the size of say the city of Kingston, about 120,000 people. And if this is of uh, further interest to council, then we could probably have a bit of a, a Zoom call with the land banking manager who senior management had that first initial uh, discussion or presentation from. Thank you, director. Anything further from members of council? Councilor LeBlanc? To your uh, chair for the director. Uh, slap me for saying this, but if we have land right now, if you look at the projects that are going on in Port Hope and Coburg, they have excess land for affordable housing and community housing. We don't have anything to partner with the county to do those things. And if we want affordable housing and low rental housing for our citizens our seniors and apartments that we can partner with the county with to get government funding, we have to have land. And right now we have no land that we can partner with. So we got to start land banking and looking for a future. We've all talked about affordable housing, low rentals, but we need the county to partner with us, but we have to have land to partner with them. So that's one of the keys that I, I like that too. We do work. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've talked about this many times and I think this sort of thing is in process um, anyway. So I'm not opposed to this motion, but I do believe that uh, we've asked for this already. But uh, when we're talking about affordable housing, and, uh, and providing um, land for the county, that would be assisted housing. I believe there's, there's a difference. Um, so I just wanna make sure, uh, obviously we need all of it. We need affordable and we need assisted, but there is a difference between um, affordable and, uh, and, and finding land for the county, which would be for assisted housing. Agreed, Councillor Anderson. Sorry, are we uh, talking just within the, uh, the boundary? Or are we talking outside the boundary for future? I, I suspect we'd want to focus on the built boundary 
otherwise we're getting into individual lots where you can't build, you know, townhomes or um, but it, apartments. what I'm referring to, it's land banking. So you're looking to the future that something's sitting right on that is almost on the edge of our next. Um, I guess I guess we, we, we'd have to look at opportunities as they exist. Uh, Director Walsh, do you have any concept of, of which direction would be the wise one to head in? Um, there's a few few parcels that come to mind, Mayor. Um, we, we've, we've talked, I think, about uh, a few parcels in previous staff reports. We've made reference to them, and there are, are a couple other sites that come to mind as well and that uh, will be subject of a future staff report. And uh, so, um, you know, if, uh, and plus we're, we're seeing our secondary plan and, our, and the county's official plan that may be resulting in some modifications to the urban boundary. So uh, with that in mind, there may be additional parcels that come to light as we take a fresh look at our urban boundaries and see what opportunities might result from that. Um, so we've had some discussions with the county planning folks about uh, improving our urban boundaries based on some environmental constraints and this sort of thing, and they seem to be open to it. So there might be some adjustments that uh, would open up some land that otherwise isn't immediately uh, currently obviously available. Um, and then maybe I'll just touch on the deputy mayor's point there about uh, assisted housing. There, you know, once we once we own land, then we uh, have a lot of uh, say, of course, and what gets use of that land. And there's a number of business models that come to mind. Uh, the options for homes model is uh, is one. I won't uh, go into the details for that, but it's more of a, a private sector oriented model that, where the municipality actually takes a bit of an equity position in the in the funnel end product uh, that the homeowner pays back at the end of 10 years if they sell it before uh, before that 10 year period it's a sliding scale and that sort of thing it has had some success so it's it's um it's only loosely associated with assistance yet but the folks are able to realize some good affordable housing at the same time uh, so there's a different approaches that we can take can we can work with the county housing servicing uh, services uh, office in uh and refining whatever model that uh, the municipality decides would uh, be their their valued preference. Thank you for that, Councillor Anderson. You had a follow up. Yeah, we. So to go back to what I was saying about outside the boundary, or you know, the official plan is going to be re re reviewed again, and and um, there was land just on outside our boundary and uh, three years ago we discussed it with uh, consultants and everything and everybody said well we can't do that but the price of land and the, and the locations i think people everybody agreed that that would be nice but we're not going to we're not going to do it at this time the longer we wait the longer and we've talked about this for three four years uh, almost four years now so um I'm I'm in agreement that we need to continue to talk about it and continue to to research it and 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 get on with it. But uh, um, I know we've talked about it, and I, I I'm disappointed that we didn't move on it quicker. But I guess we didn't see a lot of this too. What's happened in the last couple of three years was shocking. So, um, but anyhow, uh, we we need to keep having that vision of what we're going to do. Thank you for that. Anything further on the motion? Council Rowley. Thank you. Um, a question for um, Mr. Walsh as well. Um, regarding private ownership of maybe of some of this lands, is this uh, some kind of initiative that could also fall under our community improvement plan that uh, municipality work with private owners on uh, some of these kind of initiatives? Director? Yeah, I believe that would be part of our options. I think that to the report that's referenced in the notice of motion is uh, one of the options was a community improvement plans as a means or as a tool towards making available affordable housing. So sure, I think that's, uh, in fact, they could work in combination, land banking and the community improvement plans. If those community improvement plans also met uh, some other forms of, of support for affordable housing and attainable housing. Attainable housing is a term that we tend to use a little bit more often and side by side with affordable housing. 
attainable, oftentimes it gets referred to rental opportunities because people don't always have that down payment uh, when they could also, but they can man, you know, maintain the, uh, or support uh, that uh, rent that they need to, to uh, uh, pay out. It's, uh, it's, it's doable, it's just the down payment's not doable. So attainable housing can be, can be also an important objective. Thank you for that. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. We have a notice of motion that will be moved by Council LeBlanc and seconded by myself. Whereas it is desirable for the municipality of Brighton to have a flower to be designated as the flower for the municipality. And whereas June 18th has been proclaimed as Garden Day in the municipality of Brighton. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the municipality of Brighton Council endorses the designation of a flower for the community. And further, that Council seeks input from the Brighton Horticultural Society Garden Club for the designation of a flower and that will come forward at our next meeting of council. The next notice of motion will be moved by Deputy Mayor Connect and seconded by myself, whereas some of the committees of council are actively involved in hiring groups and organizations to perform or provide a service to our community. And whereas it's often impossible and also time consuming for community volunteers to obtain three quotes for such services, especially when it's the desire for these committees to have local performers and performers and service providers for events. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Council of the Municipality of Brighton direct staff to prepare an alternative purchasing procedure for committees of council that removes the need to get three quotes while still allows the proper oversight and internal controls. And that will come forward as a motion at the next meeting of council. 10.4 has been amended to be read as a motion. And it is moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Councillor Anderson, whereas during the last several months, there has been an increase in vandalism within the municipality, including municipal property. Therefore, staff are requested to arrange a meeting to include affected stakeholders, along with community policing, police services, and OPP to discuss preventative options, which could include additional security cameras in our downtown core. Is there any discussion? Councillor Rowley. Thank you, Mayor. Um... I know, as I sit on the uh, DBIA as well, there, we have had some um, discussions as well concerning um, issues that have been happening in the in the downtown core, especially. Um, and we've we've been receiving emails from staff here as well as far as what's been going vandalizing on our uh, municipal properties. So I guess um, my thought with this, along with uh, Councillor Anderson, thank you for supporting that. That we. Uh, Maybe just get a group to just get a group together. Uh, whether we sit down with the DBIA, sit down with uh, as that are listed here, the Police Services Board, and that just to kind of consider what can be done or how how we can prevent maybe some of this. And uh, there's been talk for many years regarding more security cameras in the downtown area. Whether that's feasible or whether there are other options that we need to be discussing. Um, as with everything, I'm sure there's a price tag. But um, it would be nice if we could just kind of get a group together to sit down and discuss how we can prevent some of what's going on. Thank you for that. Anything further for members of council? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. We have nothing list listed under unfinished business that takes us into bylaws. The first bylaw is an agreement between uh, Jeffrey Wallen's construction for the King Edward concession retrofit and it's moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second and third reading and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and the clerk to execute an agreement between the corporation of the municipality of Brighton and Jeffrey G. Wallen's construction limited for the King Edward concession retrofit. Is there any discussion? Councillor Bateman. I apologize. I meant to ask this when we were discussing it. What's the time frame for doing this? I only ask because there's quite a bit going on down there now with the roof, the pickleball, and the retrofit. On the last motion, the time frame? The paving. Oh, with all the, the construction that down there, yeah. Because that's what you're talking about now is the Jeffrey Wallens. Oh, no, sorry. No, I'm this... jumping ahead. You're looking at the paving the parking lot, so with the retrofit. But I'll bring that up when we get to the paving part. I don't think we have a bylaw for the paving part. So let's let's answer the question now. 
the paving of the parking lot? I was jumping ahead. We approved the, the, the money, but I, I saw the retrofit and I thought we were going to have another construction project down there besides the roof and the pickleball. Yeah. So it, it's on, it's underway right now. And I think yeah. it's almost complete. It's the, um, this is the contract to um, renovate the concession stand for the pop-up project. Yeah. They worked on it all last week and they're working on it again this week. This should be pretty much done by the end of this week. So by the, by the time we get this bylaw signed, they should be complete if we, if we don't take too much longer debating. it, That's going on at the same time as the pickleball in behind? Yeah, but they're almost done. Anything further for members of council? Go ahead, Councillor Tadman. I guess we just have to pass this so that the guy's going to get his money. <laughs> One would think so, yes. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Anything further? All those in favor? Any opposed? That motion's carried. I didn't, I didn't catch. Okay, Councillor LeBlanc for the record, uh, vacated the chambers at 825, returned to 826 PM. He is fast. The next bylaw is the agreement with the Codrington Community Association moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman. The council gives a bylaw, it's first, second and third reading and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute an agreement between the corporation of the municipality of Brighton and the Codrington Community Association for the operation and maintenance of the Codrington Community Center for a period of three years commencing January 1st, 2022. Is there any discussion? Councillor Bateman. Uh, just, uh, just under 12.1 and 12.2. That's why I was jumping ahead when we were discussing paving parking lots and that 12.1 and 12.2 in the black one indicates the concession retrofit yes. the other agreement with the cca but the highlighted that you can click on are both for the retrofit so it showed two different constructions going on on the agenda right so the the can you not click on the agreement yeah but 12.2 and 12.1 i see Oh, it are supposed to be two different things, but they're both I the see. same. That's why I thought we had two constructions going on down there. There you go. I see. Anything further from members of council? All those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next bylaw is with regard to the overall, op overall responsible operator service agreement between Brighton and Aqua. It's moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date, being a bylaw to enter into an overall responsible operator service agreement between the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton and the Ontario Clean Water Agency. Is there any discussion? Councillor Tadman. I have brought, uh, I, I uh, moved that to bring it to the floor, but I de need more information before I make a decision on actually... Uh, and, and maybe somebody else would like to, I think I'm moving on that motion. You are the mover. Did yeah. You, did you want to withdraw your name? I think I do, yes. Okay. Yeah. Is it, could I get someone to move this motion so we can put it on the floor? Councillor Anderson. So it's now moved by Councillor Anderson, seconded by Councillor Bateman. Is there any discussion from members of council? Councillor Bateman. Just for clarification, this is just the bylaw to basically endorse what we, we spoke about in closed session back on May 2nd, correct? Under That's why I had brought up earlier when we were doing the agenda, 5.1 under the closed session was talking about this contract. Correct. And this is just us uh, saying, yes, we're gonna proceed with that contract. Correct? That is correct. Okay, so the other point I would make when I was looking at both of them in the original one that we spoke about on May 2nd, it had a specific time frame. both say short-term agreement, but in the May 2nd, when we were speaking about it, we put actual 60 days and the new agreement, it just says temporary basis. So are we going to stick with the 60 days? Just saying temporary, that could be very open-ended. I, I believe this expires July 3rd or something like that. CAO? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the uh, term of this agreement is as discussed uh, back in May, it is a 60 day agreement commencing uh, May 4th and expiring on July 3rd. But it is extendable, is that correct? That's correct. Anything further from members of council? Councillor LeBlanc? 
Yes, thank you. Do we not have two OROs, one for wastewater and one for water already qualified in, in the municipality? Sale. Um, we certainly have uh, OROs uh, available on the uh, water side, including a backup. We have uh, one uh, individual on the waste side that uh, could act as an ORO. The challenge for us is that uh, when that one individual is off for any reason, sickness or leave or vacation or whatever, we don't have a backup. And in order to remain uh, legislatively compliant, we need to have that backup in place. And that was a real life scenario just a few weeks ago. So we had to make sure that uh, we are legislatively compliant. Councilor Rowley. Thank you. Regarding this contract being uh, extendable, uh, is that something then um, before July 3rd that would come back to council for us to review? Is that, is that required to come back to council CAO or do you have authority to extend this? Well, cer cer certainly um, um, I'm having ongoing discussions with, uh, uh, with Aqua to extend on a short-term basis. Uh, obviously that'll come forward to uh, council in, uh, in due course. The reality is that we don't have a backup in place today. And my concern is we may not have a backup in place by July 3rd. So once again, I have to make sure that uh, the municipality is legislatively compliant and do what needs to be done in order to make that happen. And if that happens to be a short, a further short extension of this agreement, then we need to do that. Mr. Castleman, um, will, this, will, will the municipality end this contract once an environmental services manager and an environmental services foreperson are hired to fill those two positions? That is exactly the intent. Thank you, Councillor Ted. So, uh, yeah, well then if, if we don't uh, secure those positions, uh, I've understood from the past, we always had two OROs for both well, we had three, I think, in the water and two in the waste. So are we actively seeking another person as an ORO? Yes, even we're, now? We're actively searching for replacements to those two positions, which would be our OROs. And in the meantime, we're asking Aqua through contract to be that ORO for, as a stopgap measure. Okay, so, so at any time, if we got another full-time ORO, we could terminate, okay. Councilor LeBlanc? Yes, uh, through your chair, uh, to the CAO. Uh, for a period of time before I was on council, since I'm on council, you, there was only one operator and there was a backup that he worked. The other ORO worked for roads and grounds and the, the wastewater treatment plant, but that tend to cease after a period of time. And uh, so there was only one person being the ORO, which was the individual that was there, that was working for it without naming names. So he didn't really have a backup for periods of time. So the one that's there now is very well qualified, understand the system, has been trained for eight years. I have, you know, and I've met the individual before I was a counselor, because I was asked for assistance by the consultants that were doing work on the wastewater treatment plant. I found them very keen and very knowledgeable. So, and I haven't talked to him since this or any of this. So, um, like, I just have a problem bringing aqua and adding more cost to the plant when you already have the two operators there, you have the OROs there in place. And you could always go back to bring one in training, learn. So that's just planning. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Um, thank you. I believe we've had this discussion and closed for purpose, and now we're kind of opening the discussion again, and, and I'm not comfortable with that. I do believe uh, that we have to agree to this in open, and I believe that's why the bylaws is, is here. So um, if I'm allowed to, I'd like to call for a vote on this. I'm going to continue the discussion, but thank you for that. Councillor Bateman. 
Uh, just a quick question. I don't know if, for you, Mayor, the CAO, if this is the way we're going to go, because we have to cover ourselves legislatively, and this came into effect May 4th, so it expires July 4th. And if we can end it at any time, and we're going to be heading into lame duck, would it not be better off if we decided as a council tonight to, to extend it? Because if we can end it at any time and you hire somebody, really it's not hurting anything, but it is covering your basis and looking to the future. Because if we don't get somebody, you still want to make sure that you have somebody. So, so. Well, I think if, if, if you wanted, we could simply add to this motion that provides the CAO with the authority to extend it so that we don't need to come back to council if that's the concern. Um, but what we're dealing with is an agreement that the CAO signed in an emergency, what, what he felt was an emergent situation. So he's brought, we've brought Aqua in to, to, for the stopgap purposes, and now he's asking council to, to sign the agreement because it was an emergent issue. Um, and we still don't have that backup ORO in, in the wastewater plant. So until such time as I say that still the, the manager and the four person are hired, um, I think we are going to need some assistance from an, an outside agency. In this case, it's Aqua. Councillor Anderson. Well, as the mover, I suggest that we give that authority to the uh, CAO so there's no delays and pressures. Is that what the concern was? If, if there's a concern, then that we aren't going to be available to make that decision. So we, we could add in further that the CAO is authorized to extend the agreement as needed. Well, it's as, a, if it's an emergency agree, decision, I... I Councillor Bateman, as the seconder, would you agree to that? Quick question. So, so what's the date that this council effectively goes into Lambda? August 19th-ish. So after that date, that wouldn't be a decision that would come to us, that would go to the CAO Correct. regardless? So... You could effectively you go either way you get extended to that leave lame duck period now. or just leave it or, open or leave, leave it as it is and let, let the ca bring it to council in july if he needs to right yeah i think i think we should just leave that's it why. yeah let's just leave it but you you'd want to make sure that you have aqua secured that's why i'd rather have that conversation well, sooner than or somebody secured right as your i suspect that they'd be fine continuing yeah. on and they probably want to do more quite frankly <laughs> Anything further for members of council? Go ahead. It's just concerning because water is probably the most important. You want to make sure that your water quality is. Uh, yeah, to be, to be clear, this is for wastewater. Yeah. This is for wastewater, but, but same yeah. deal. So yeah. we're covered because yeah. I've heard so many different levels. Of RO. So we have the water OROs. Yes. And it's just, a, we're lacking just on the wastewater OR. Correct. So we're hundred percent with backups on the other stuff as well. Right. Councilor Tadman. No, I have nothing more to say. Let's just get on. With All those it. in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? The motion is carried. That takes us to reports of advisory committees of council. Um, pardon me. Reports of advisory committees of council. Reports and minutes and council reports. The first is accessibility advisory committee meeting minutes, April 8th. Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council received the April 8th, 2022 Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Motions carried. The next is Digital Archives, moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council received the April 26th, 2022 Brighton Digital Archives Advisory Committee meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? Those in favor? There being none opposed, that motion's carried. Next is economic development. Moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman, that Council received the April 7th, 2022 economic development meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. And finally, Applefest advisory. Moved by Deputy Mayor Connect, seconded by Councilor LeBlanc, the Council received the April 20th, 2022 Applefest Advisory meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. Okay. 
That brings us to reports, minutes of statutory committees, boards, and external agencies. The first is the library board, moved by Councilor LeBlanc, seconded by Council Rowley. The council received the library board March 23rd, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. The next is Lower Trent, moved by Council Rowley, seconded by Council LeBlanc. The council received the Lower Trent Board April 28th, 2022 meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. That brings us to correspondence, direction items, endorsements, communications, and petitions. The only piece of correspondence is from the municipality of Muskoka regarding emergency exercise exemption. It's moved by Councilor Tadman, seconded by Councilor Bateman. The council receive or endorse, I'll need to know which one, resolution from the municipality of Muskoka regarding the annual emergency exercise exemption. And having just FYI, having uh, received correspondence from the fire chief, the fire chief um, would endorse this if he had the option. There you go. Councilor Bateman. You okay with that as a seconder? So it is. it reads that council endorsed the resolution. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. And FYI correspondence, the first from Firefighters Without Borders, moved by Councilor Tadman, seconded by Councilor Bateman, that council received the correspondence from Carl Egeman, Vice President of Firefighters Without Borders. Is there any discussion? Chief, I wonder if you would make a brief statement on this for us. Oh, he's got prepared remarks. That's concerning. <laughs> there you go. Now push the button in front of you. Stop, stop pushing the side button. <laughs> All right. There you go. Pretty good. Yeah. Well, I got that figured out. Uh, Your Worship, so we did receive an email from uh, Carl Eggman from Firefighters Without Borders um, in regards to the, the pomper 270 that we took out of service. Uh, that, that particular pomper, the transmission was gone. I did speak with Carl. Carl did read the whole email or the whole gov deal section where it said that. So they weren't in the position to pay twenty to $30,000 to fix the transmission so that they could donate it to, a, to another fire department. Um, fire department or firefighters without borders is a great organization. I think Carl Eggman has some ties to Brighton as well. He was an OPP officer. I think he was, I think he was in this detachment. Yeah. So he's, he's a great guy. And we, uh, we have participated in all the local fire departments already donate to firefighters without borders. So an example is our bunker gear. Our bunker gear is mandated for 10 years of lifespan for interior attack, but it would still help, um, a native reserve is where we always ask for our stuff to go to Northern Ontario or Manitoba. And uh, that gear could be used for our, an exterior attack, if you want to say, but it gives them some protective equipment that they wouldn't have normally. So we um, personally am very close with uh, Chief Scott Miracle from the Mohawks in Titanaga, who looks across the, all across the country to help source these, the native reserves and communities that that need the help. So we, we support this when we can. So we do our spring cleaning, basically, that we have any extra gear. Uh, Deputy Hutchison and I will take that to, to and ask Carl to pick it up. Thank you, appreciate that. And happy to know that we're supporting the, the cause and the organization. Yeah, our That's only stipulation is it stays in Ontario or Manitoba and it goes, because you don't have to go very far north. To, right, no, there's need. For, yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Anything uh, further on the motion? All in favor? Motion's carried. And next is the county update moved by Councillor Tadman, second by Councillor Bateman. The council received the Northumberland County update May 23rd to June 3rd, 2022 as information. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Being none opposed, that motion's carried. Brings us to question period. Is there anyone in the gallery who has a question with regard to an item on tonight's agenda? Going once, twice. Anyone coming in on Zoom? I don't see anyone. We have no in-camera session this evening. 
That brings us to our confirmatory bylaw moved by Councillor Bateman, seconded by Councillor Tadman. The Council gives a bylaw, it's first, second, and third reading, and finally passes on this date. Being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Corporation of the Municipality of Brighton Council meeting held on June 6, 2022. Any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried. And finally, a motion moved by Councillor Tadman, seconded by Councillor Bateman, that the June 6, 2022 Council meeting adjourn at 8.46 p.m. Is there any discussion? All in favor? There being none opposed, that motion is carried.